Good morning and welcome to the second day of URUS 2020. We will start with a keynote speech in a minute. Before that, just a few numbers from yesterday. Uh, we had about, um, on average, 100 attendees in the WebEx event. And on, on the live stream that was uh, on YouTube, we had another uh, 200 viewers um in, in total on the stream so not not always on the same time so that's quite good and probably more than would have uh, attended at a, a non-virtual event yeah with this i uh, enjoy this second day and i hand over to mark van der Lohe, who is chairing the um, keynote session Thank you, Alex. So it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, uh, Matthias Tempel. Um, Matthias is a, a fellow at the Digital Initiative of the Canton of Zurich in uh, Switzerland. And he's a lecturer and researcher at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. And he's also a lecturer and researcher by appointment at the Vienna University of Technology. Uh, before that, he was uh, working for, I think, about 12 years at the uh, Statistics Office of Austria. And um, I would say that Matthias is really one of the pioneers of using R in official statistics. It's hard to mention official statistics and R and not think about Matthias. He was one of the first, maybe even the first, I think, to use R in any serious way in official statistics and starting contributing packages um, and so he broke a lot of barriers for us, I think not only in terms of technical challenges, like implementing uh, algorithms that we, are, that we can use, but also organizatorial barriers like how to install an open source package in, an, uh, in a regulated environment. So as a community, we can all be very grateful for that. Um, Matthias uh, wrote or contributed to at least 16 R packages that I could find and in a very broad area of uh, topics, uh, disclosure control, imputation, packages for teaching, uh, robust uh, statistics, clustering. And lately, in the, in the last couple of years, he has become very interested in functional data analysis. Um, he's written in total uh, or contributed to like 63 peer reviewed papers and recently he also published a book on functional data analysis with R. Uh, so, a huge number, number of achievements from which we can all benefit, I think. Um, before I hand off uh, to you, Matthias, just uh, two more achievements. One achievement is that he's also the first person that I witnessed opening and drinking a beer during a talk at the USR conference, <laughs> but all in the name of science, all in the name of science. Um, and I heard that he will become a father for the second time in December. So. Congratulations to you and your wife, uh, Matthias, for that. Um, one final remark uh, for the people following this, please uh, put all your questions in the Q&A. You can also do this uh, during the talk if you're joining via WebEx. And then in the end, uh, we're going to uh, um, let uh, Matthias answer them. So Matthias, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let me share my slides first. So, uh, first, thanks a lot, a lot to Alexander Kubarik for organizing this conference. I think it's we really, really run smoothly and fine. Uh, thanks, Mark, to, for the introduction. And also thanks to the Romanian team for initiating this conference series. Uh, today, uh, maybe I, I've scared some people about because of my, my title of the presentation. <laughs> uh, it's an an application of compositional data analysis in the area of functional data analysis. So today you will not see so much R code and, and R packages. You see more or less a primer on research in official statistics using R. So first I had to introduce a little bit the topic of compositional data analysis. Um, I think that's not well known in official statistics, still not well known. But we have many, many data sets which are compositional. 
And uh, I will show today that if you apply classical statistical methods on compositional data, that's really dangerous and you get really, you can receive very ar arbitrary results. Uh, so you should think about compositional data analysis. Uh, so the first part, so the first 20 minutes, uh, I will um, introduce uh, some concepts of compositional data. You will see some examples um, on compositional data and some comments on it. Uh, of course, I can give you only a, a short impression about that. In the second part, also about 20 minutes, I will show you an application of compositional data analysis in the field of functional data analysis. And we will see what, what this is, and you will see some examples of functional data in official statistics. I think it could be quite interesting to see that. So thinking on Mark, uh, a picture of Piet Mondrian, a Dutch uh, a painter. You see a composition, I think that's one of his uh, greatest work, works. He, I think he needed about 15 years to finish this uh, work, which he called the harmony of life, uh, which lays under the beneath of the surface. Uh, and for him, it was very important to find the right proportions in the picture. So it's not about the size, the general size of the picture, it's about the proportions, the ratios between blue and uh, the, the red area and so on. So that's typically compositional information because if you would increase the blue area, automatically you have less space for the other areas. So automatically you have less space for the red area, let's say. So if we uh, write these areas the, the, um, in some, let's say in some proportions, let's say the first area is about one divided by 15, so that's the largest in, in percentage. Uh, the sum of all that, info, all that areas would be, for example, 100, if this, this data represented as percentages. So most of the area is in the, the red color and then the rest. So the absolute values are not really important. Uh, also for Piet Mondrian, it was important to find the right ratios between the areas and colors and so on. So if you see that the right picture, that's just a smaller version of the left one, it's not important how large the values are, it's only important the ratios are important. And that's compositional data analysis. Uh, in compositional data analysis, the ratios are important. So to describe this picture, you could either use all ratios, so the ratio from the uh, first area to the uh, red area, from the first area to the second white area, and so on. Or you could, uh, like, say, um, take a mean somehow, uh, so a normalized uh, uh, area size, like this first area in the left uh, upper corner, to, the, to a mean, let's say, of all uh, ratios. And we will go further into details afterwards, but that's the main concept to represent data as ratios. Uh, an old outdated view is always to say uh, compositional data are only data which are closed by a fixed constant like, like one or hundred. And we will see that's not true. Uh, we have much more compositional data which are not fixed as a constant sum like one or hundred. An example here from Austria in inter interactive map, and you see the, uh, in each, each region, you see how many uh, percent of the people have a degree at university, have a degree at uh, uh, high school and so on. So expressed in per percentages. You see that, for example, in we are, uh, Alex is sitting in Vienna somewhere here, we have more than in some areas, more than 21% of the population who has uh, at least the minimum requirements of school. So let's go a little bit more formal. Uh, so what, what, are, what is a simplex? That's a representation of compositional data. You see an observation here with D entries. So we call it composition. Uh, all these... Uh, entries of this composition have larger value than zero. 
and this sum up to a certain fixed constant kappa. But this uh, constant can be different for each observation of in your data set. So that's somehow uh, composition data is always a, a representation of parts of a certain whole. Uh, think of uh, income parts that sum up to the general income. Think of wage components that sum up to the whole wage, tax components, and so on. Uh, the whole, the information, the whole is irrelevant. We will see, and and yeah. So that's a multivariate data. So we are speaking always about multivariate data analysis here, where the relative information is important. So you, usually, for example, in geochemistry, we have a lot of compositional data expressed in parts per million, for example. Or uh, I already mentioned wage components, tax components, and so on. Uh, expenditures of a household, for example, expressed in euro or dollars or something. Uh, hours of a day, so if you sleep, uh, let's say, 12 hours, you have only 12 hours uh, left without sleeping. If you sleep only eight hours, you have more hours left for other activities. So it's also an inner relationship in such data sets. Uh, let's see a very simple example. Uh, so there's data sets from the World Health Organization about alcohol consumption. So the mix of beer, wine, and spirits, that information sums up to 100 and we see just one observation here, Romania, that's a beer drinking uh, nation, I would say, like Austria or Netherlands or Germany. Uh, so about 50% of the people drink mainly beer. Uh, if they drink alcohol, they drink beer, so 50%. Uh, and you see now this uh, meaning of a simplex, you see not, uh, the observations only living in this gray area, and you cannot have an, an, an observation which, which are laying outside this area because there's a fixed constant of 100. So you cannot drink more than 100% of beer. Uh, but you see, uh, that's, let's say, a, a shrinked uh, space. That's uh, um, uh, not the Euclidean space. And that's the reason why you should not apply classical statistics to these data sets because uh, it doesn't make sense. Correlation doesn't make sense. It's always forced to be negative just because of the data represented in the simplex and not in the Euclidean vector space. So compositional data follows another geometry, so called Eichen geometry. Um, we usually like to represent the data in so called log ratios. Uh, and we have some diff requirements which we'll, def we'll define in, in some minutes. Uh, a data set can be compositional and non-compositional at the same time. That's just a little bit more modern view on compositional data. Uh, thinking of a margarita. Uh, so the taste of the margarita is uh, only based on the uh, mixing of, of lime juice, triple sect, and tequila. So depends only on the ratios between these elements, uh, but so if you want to analyze the taste of a, a margarita, then the compositional information is important. If you are only interested to get drunk, then the absolute information on the killer is important. So a data set can be compositional and non-compositional, depending what you're doing afterwards. And there's a lot of ex uh, examples of compositional data, Con contingency tables are Compositional data, probability tables, compositional tables, mortality data, basket data, hours of a day I already mentioned. Every time where you represent your data in percentages or ratios of a whole, uh, ends on tax wage and expenditure data, poll data are, expen um, are typically compositional, uh, and so on. And also in official statistics, we really see a lot of data set with, with a fixed row sums, like 100%. And even probability density functions are compositions. We know that the probability density function, the integral is 1, and that's typically um, compositional. We will go, go afterwards to that, that topic. So if you 
Click, for example, on the Eurostat website, I only listed a few of compositional data there, the agricultural Lucas land coverage data, COVID-19 tourism number of trips, intra EU 28 trade data by member state, population counts as percentages, and so on. So there's an almost infinite list of compositional data there. Uh, there are some requirements. Uh, so if we want, if we multiply up composition by a constant, we should get the same results. Um, so if we analyze the data, uh, the original raw data and the composition multiplied by a constant, you should get the same results. Uh, also, when you reorder the variables, you should get the same results. But I think that's obvious. And the most important requirement is this subcompositional sub coherence. Uh, if you delete one variable in your data set, then uh, the result should be not in contradiction to your previous results. So we will see an example there shortly. And if you, yeah, if you don't select one variable, it should not have an influence of your results. But I can show you afterwards if you do apply classical statistic, statistics, if you suppress one variable and do the analysis on the rest, you will get different results as previously. Let's see a very uh, toy, toy data set example. We have expenditures of households uh, here. So the first observation has 1,710 expenditures in Euro on housing and some food stuff, transport and communication. That's typically compositional data because if the household spend more on housing, he has automatically left uh, less money available for other, other things, for transport, for example. So if you ex uh, express the same data in Swiss francs or dollars or a mix of it, if we analyze both data sets, we should get the same results. That's compositional data, the aim of compositional data set. Uh, even if we express the same information as percentage, percentages, so we divide 1,710 uh, by the row sum, 3,800, we divide 950 by the row sum, and so on. So we get the expression in percentages. And still, that's the same information as above, because the ratios are the same. So if we look at the ratios, 1,710 divided by 950 is equal 1,846 divided by 1,026, and it's equal by 45 divided by 25. And even if we don't measure communication, but only measure housing, foodstuff, and transport, and build again the ratios, we will see the numbers, um, the information in percentages uh, changes, but the ratios still are the same. So, uh, 52.9 divided by 29.4, it's the same as 45 divided by 25. So again, a composition analysis where we look only on ratios, you will get the same results if you only anal analyze a subcomposition. Last example here, uh, P uh, data set from Eurostat, PhD students in some countries, and you see, for example, in Austria, we have about 4,978 PhD students studying technical science, 6,374 studying socio-economic or low studies, and so on. And what we are interested in is, in the again, in the ratios, we, will, we want to see if, uh, for example, in Austria, there are more technical studies students um, in relation to all students in the country, as in Hungary or something. So uh, the absolute information is not very interested. You, you see here two variables of this data set, health against technical studies. And you're, of course, you see that the US is highest because it's the largest country with the most students. So that that's information is not very interested. That's the reason why people uh, tend to represent the data in percentages. And you see the... Um, Percentages of PhD students in health studies against the percentages of uh, students in technical studies. Uh, and again, you can see, for example, Switzerland is here in the middle. Austria, we have not so much technical uh, students, but also not so much 
health students. You see, you see that the accreditation is approximately zero. So what happens if we don't measure one variable? So if we don't measure the variable social economics and low studies, and build again uh, uh, percentages, we get a different picture. It's the same data set, we just don't, didn't measure one variable. And you see the correlation structure changes, the correlation is on negative, so that may, doesn't make sense. So you don't measure one variable and you get completely other, other results between the correlation of two variables. So in other words, classical statistics leads to arbitrary results, should be avoided. Uh, what's the success then? How we how we tackle this problem? We go from the simplex to the Euclidean vector space. So from this, uh, there's many possibilities to do that, uh, and it's well implemented in software in R, and only in R. Uh, the simplest choice is using these centered log ratio coordinates. You present your data uh, in these coordinates, and how to do that? So if you have one observation, one composition, uh, you each entry of this composition is divided by the geometric mean of the whole composition. And then we take the log. That we do for each entry here, we divide by the geometric mean. As said before in the picture of Piet Mondrian, we divide each area by a mean of the areas. And that's, that's the same, same idea here. And we can show that if we do that uh, transformation, we end up in an Euclidean space and we can apply usual statistic, classic statistic, statistical methods. Uh, there's a whole book about this uh, applied compositional data analysis. Uh, it's, I think, a very modern view on this topic with a lot of examples and uh, a lot of applications. And there's software behind this book. Uh, the software called ROP Compositions, an R, R package. So all this theory you can apply in, in R. So let's switch to functional data. That's also interesting. Uh, a lot of data sets in official statistics are also functional. We see an example of Italy, income of persons in regions. So you see the whole income distribution of persons in each region here. And that's typically, uh, you can express this as probability density function, and you can then compare these probability density functions uh, for each region, for example. Or there's one region, for example, where, we have, where you have higher income than in the others. And there's some regions where, you have, where people tend to have less income. Or, Let's look at mortality data here, Austrian total death rates between 1982 and 2015. Uh, unfortunately, there is no legend here. But, uh, you see that the log death rates against age. So age is somehow continuous information. And for each age, you can estimate the uh, death rate. Or mortality by age and cows. Population counts for each class, each municipality. We will see an application afterwards with such data sets. Children growths, um, Mark mentioned children. It's quite exciting uh, when a baby has, an unborn baby has about uh, 0 0.5 kilogram and then he grows to one kilogram. That's quite an achievement. Uh, but when the uh, child is already 16 years old and he has 70 kilos and he grows to 70.5 kilos, that you don't basically don't see, uh, but the Euclidean distance is the same, yeah? and that's the reason why the Euclidean distance doesn't fit to also to such data sets. So we we need other concepts here. Uh, let me formalize this once. Uh, also, what are functional data sets? Uh, that's a samples that each data point lays on a random curve. And if you have an observation, x, x, and x, i is the i of observation at time t on a continuous support in a certain interval. Uh, this, uh, so this continuous notation is somewhat conceptual because, of course, we measure always discreetely on time points t1 to t, tn, for example. Uh, so the first step is always in functional data analysis 
going from discrete data, fitting curves to discrete data so that we have curves. And the um, most popular application in functional data analysis, functional principle component analysis. Uh, and this is based on probability density functions and probability density functions in any case, a very important concept. So all your, our students learn that in every basic statistics lecture, they learn about the density function. And density functions are compositional. Let's have an application here. So we have population data in the certain regions of the region of Austria. Uh, there are 57 municipalities on 19 age groups times gender. So why I use these data sets? Because it's op uh, this data set is open data, so I can use it easily. And I was uh, a motivated guy is born there in Linz land, so that's myself. <laughs> So I have some connections with the data sets. So let's look at the population pyramids, the population counts so from the age here. And of course, uh, the uh, largest line here, polygon line here is Linz, because Linz is the capital and there's um, most of the inhabitants living in Linz or quite a bunch of them. And there's a lot of small municipalities and not so much people live, and you see that on the population pyramid, you see that there's less old people, there's many people uh, with the age around 25 to 50 and so on, and we can look at that for men and women. So this information is not so exciting, because if you, for example, uh, if you print that information on a map, uh, so for example, the total population counts, yeah, of course, Linz, the most people, um, well, many people living in Linz, that's, of, of course, then very black here, um, these areas in, in Linz, and you cannot see so much. So it's quite uninteresting information, I would say. Interesting, but we will, we want to tell more, more story. Yeah. Of course, you can now visualize also the population means, you can visualize, uh, how many people uh, are between one and two years old, and you can print that information on a map and so on, but you will end up in hundreds of maps. And to compare hundreds of maps, that's, that's, that's not that what we want. Uh, we could also display other indicators, for, for example, the ratio of young people to old people represent such an indicator on a map, but it's only one indicator. We want to tell um, more on the data, so we want to visualize and summarize the output of the whole age pyramid in each uh, municipality and want to compare them. So we are interested in the whole distribution age, so we are interested in the functional data. Um, the first idea is to build ratios between the counts in, in any municipality. So we build just for each region, we look at uh, how many people are between one and two years old, divided by the total number of the, in the municipality. Uh, the next ratio is um, people that are between three and five years old, uh, divided by the total number of municipalities, uh, of people in the municipality, and so on. So we just built relative information because we see this absolute, in, absolute values are not so interesting because it's dominated by links, for example. And there could be some questions like, uh, will the region of Linz have a larger, uh, relatively higher amount of young people than, for example, in other areas? And these questions we would like to answer. So if you present the proportions of these 57 uh, uh, population counts in each mun municipality, you see that curve. So again, uh, there's less people which are old. Um, many people are around 50. So the proportion of people who are around 50 is the largest, and so on. And where you see the tendency that the women get a little bit older than the men, and so on. So these are almost density functions, but that's, we, 
Again, discrete measurements, so we have to come from discreteness to continuous functions first. So the goal is to analyze this density of the age distribution after a uh, dimension reduction, like uh, using principal component analysis. We know that density integrates the one, uh, and density consists of only relative information. Uh, so the standard methods of functional data analysis are really not appropriate, I would say, because if you, for example, sum two densities, so a convolution of two densities, the result is not the density. If you multiply a density with other density, the result is not a density. I will show a picture in, in, in a minute about that. Uh, even we will see that with the classical approach, you can even uh, for the fit, if you want to reconstruct the data with the first two principal components, for example, you can have negative estimates of density values, also something what we don't like to have. And already mentioned with the age, age of the child, so the Euclidean distance uh, doesn't make sense uh, much. So what is the solution? Um, so in general, a probability density function uh, is a, a compositional vector with infinite many parts. Uh, so when we use the concept of compositional data analysis and this log ratio approaches, and we call that somehow the date that the data lays in a so-called so base Hilbert space instead of the Lebesgue standard measure. So the all integrable function usually uh, the Lebesgue space is the uh, um, um, is that space where the data lives, and we don't want to analyze this data set. Also, our data sets we define a so-called base Hilbert space. In this base Hilbert space, we can define a norm, an inner product, addition, multiplication. Uh, that's quite complicated. I only want to see the re want to show you the results about addition and multiplication later. Uh, and the good news is that if we multiply two densities or if we add some up two densities, the result is again a density then. And also the good news is uh, that we can transform our data set sets uh, using a log ratio transformation to the base space. And in the base space, we can apply the usual methods, classical statistical methods. So that's already the uh, sum, the addition and multiplication. For example, if we add two densities, the result is again a density in the compositional approach. In the classical statistical approach, classical functional data analysis, the result is not the density. Also, if we multiply a density by a constant, the result is again a density in our approach. In classical statistics, it's not. So coming back, uh, first thing that they said, smoothing is necessary. Uh, how to smooth data sets? Uh, there's many, many possibilities. And often we use natural cubic splines between, so we define knots and between each knots we fit a spline with some constraints that for smoothness. Um, so we can do that, for example, with our data sets, we see the age distribution in municipality 40101 and so that's our actual values and we can fit the spline here for example uh, we can do that also for men and women here uh, in the original data set or in the CLRs and the centered log ratio transformed data set the each ratio is divided by the total and also by geometric mean and taking the log uh, we will come back afterwards why this is so, so important and we can do that for all municipalities so each line represents the age distribution of one in one municipality so for how to do that we, we, we already said we want to do principal component analysis that's the most prominent application functional data analysis so we can compare this high dimensional data uh, and fit uh, uh, represent our data sets with less uh, scores. Um, 
So that's typically done with principal component analysis. I don't want to inter go into detail in the formulas here, only the idea. So the, we want to describe the main variability of the data set with uh, k-linear combinations of the original variables. And we took these uh, combinations like that, so that in the first principal component, we explain the most variability of the data set. And the second direction, uh, the second principal component is then orthogonal to the first uh, principal component and explaining again the most of the rest of the variability of the data and so on. Uh, so the output, uh, so-called eigenfunctions of a covariance matrix, uh, describing the variables and scores, representing the observations. Um, and typically we use the first two, let's say two principal components to describe, to, exp to interpret our data, multiple data set, and we do that through uh, a biplot usually. So don't be afraid, so that's quite a standard approach of, of, of principal component analysis. And for our new method, we, that's quite complicated. Uh, so there are quite complicated uh, uh, equations. So I also want to, do not want to go into detail here, but the main idea is to represent the data first in centered log ratio coordinates and then do a principal component analysis. So the idea is quite simple. Uh, it's efficiently imp implemented and um, yeah. so let's let's go to some practical examples here. Uh, first is a simulation. We simulated 100 densities from a gamma distribution. So we took just different values for the, for the parameters for the gamma distribution. That's our data set, again a high dimensional data set here and we have 100 of these curves. So what we do now is to apply the classical approach, functional principal component analysis, and we will see with the first principal component, we explain about 60% of the variance in the data, with the second about 30% of the variance in the data. Uh, keeping that in mind, so on this lower harmonics curves, we go into detail in some minutes. Uh, what is the uh, difference when we use uh, our approach? So if we first present the data in uh, centered log ratio co uh, coordinates and then apply these functional principal components, we see that the explained variance with the first component is almost 100% array. So it's, it's much better, better uh, as a we explain much more variation in the data with the first principal component. And with uh, this first two principal component, we explain basically the whole data set. Also, the scores doesn't look like nonlinear anymore, they are linear. So in general, we have much a better fit. Yeah. And if what if you use now these uh, first, first two principal components to reconstruct original densities, we will see with the classical statistical approach, we also receive negative densities and uh, changed a lot, I would say. And with, what if we use the first two principal components with our new approach, we can perfectly reconstruct our original densities. So having that in mind, that we really get better results, uh, we go to the practical application now. Um, so let's discuss these results on this Austrian population data uh, here. So what if you apply that on the on these age distributions? We see that with the first principal component, we explain about eighty percent of the variance in the data. And with the first two, we explain already about 90% of the variation in the data. We see the first principal component. Um, we have higher scores for the elderly people. And for the second principal component, the scores are very low for the people between about 69 to 90 years old and for the small children. And in the middle age, age range, we have positive scores. Uh, 
let's take a byplot of that. So the first principal component against the second principal component. And uh, this, uh, we just represent the abbreviation of the names of the municipalities of the counties. And for example, Gmunden GM is quite on the right, has high, uh, a high score on the first principal component. Also Gmunden here has also a high score on the first principal component, but also on the second principal component. So and with this information, uh, together with a map, we can now interpret, interpret our results. Let's look at the map here, the so-called uh, LISA maps. So if, uh, if you have high scores, that's for women's, if you have high scores in the regions and also around the regions, uh, we get the red. If we get the blue, we have, if you have low scores and all other regions around the regions also low, that's called LISA maps, then we get the blue here. Uh, what we see, uh, the red area in the bottom, that's Gmunden and Enstal, we see the people are quite old uh, relative to the whole age distribution in these regions. Uh, what we see, also see that young people are moving to the capital, uh, Linz and surroundings, and above Linz we see a lot of, we can interpret there's a lot of families here. Why I can interpret that? If we go back to the uh, scores here, we see, for example, Gmunden has very large uh, score on the first principal component. Uh, and if we look at the harmonics here, we see a large value of the first principal component means old. Um, uh, there's there are relatively more old people than young people. Okay, so I can interpret that maps uh, also the second principal component. For example, here in uh, blue, we have Rohrbach, Scherding and surrounding. We see that uh, way too much old people relative to the whole age distribution live there, uh, especially for the women's. So the women's in, emigrated there. The women's come to Linz or somewhere, somewhere else to study somewhere else or something. Uh, why we can interpret that? Because if we look at the scores again for the women, and we look, for instance, Scherding has a high score there on the first principal component, but also on the second, a negative one, and a negative, high negative score on the second principal component means there is too much uh, uh, people between 69 and 92 years old. So with combination of all these graphics, we can well interpret these graphics. Also, for example, on the highway here, that's the red zone here. Uh, we have high scores on the second principal component, but means high score on the second principal component. We can look again here, Perg, for example, Linzland, the area where I, have, I was born, has high score on the second principal component. What means a high score on the second principal component? that the uh, people between 30 and 60 are overrepresented. Uh, there are more people, um, relatively more people to the whole uh, age distribution in that areas. And that we see here, so we have a lot of people who are fit to work in that region here. So I was, so summing up, what was the main idea for this presentation? It was not so much focused on R, even I would have one slide uh, for, for software afterwards. So it should, uh, uh, so compositional data set, data analysis is not well known in official statistics, unfortunately. There's a lot of uh, data sets which are compositional. And for example, looking at uh, contingency tables, probability tables, where we always built in compositional uh, in official statistics, but also if we look at wage components and so on, expenditures, this all are compositional data sets. And uh, knowing now that we have a lot of compositional data, please use this uh, theory of compositional data sets because if you apply classical statistics, you really can end up in very arbitrary results. Uh, I also wanted to show some um, 
give a primer on the need and usefulness of new research, especially in official statistics, especially when uh, uh, people working in the statistical offices, it's always a fight to have the freedom to do some research. We all know that. We have so many projects which are not research-based, I would say. We have so much other things to do. It's really important, again, to have a little bit focus on, on research and official statistics, also from the statistical agencies. Uh, we shown that with the compositional approach, we improved functional data analysis, so the results are really much better, I would say. But this is also not known in the functional data analysis community. That's a very new approach. Uh, with this application, I think it was only one special application, but you can think about uh, um, e uh, income distributions in regions, for example, and so on. And you can apply the same approach on, on, on such a data set. Even it's extended, uh, the approach is also extended for regression. So regression for functional data if you have a response, response which is functional. There's another ideas and applications, for example, in small area estimations when you have proportions. Um, there's also papers about, for example, fitting confidence intervals of ratios for complex surveys. And so there is some activities in that, in that area. Uh, we applied it also on mortality statistics with very nice results, but unpublished yet. And as said before, um, it's also extended to functional reg regression context. And there's a paper, new paper, which have more mathematical foundations of these probability density functions uh, in base spaces by some Czech authors here. So coming back to R as the last comment, uh, so all these methods for compositional data analysis are implemented in the package compositions and also in the package rock compositions. ROP, because we're always interested in robust estimation. So there's always, for example, if you do discriminant analysis, there's also a robust version uh, there. Uh, compositional spline, if you want to do the spline fit for compositional data. Uh, and there's a lot of methods, for example, for imputation of missing values, principal component analysis, for contingency tables and related tests, there's functions. For these uh, log ratio transformations, there's a function called SENLR, which we use today, uh, or more general isometric log ratio transformations, for cluster analysis, for discriminant analysis, and many, many multivet methods. There are the compositional versions implemented in this package of compositions. And we have also about 45 compositional data sets included so that you, that you have an idea uh, which data sets uh, can, could be compositional. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthias, for uh, really an uh, uh, eye-opening uh, talk, I think. Uh, if I speak from my own experience, uh, I think that we uh, sort of struggle with these uh, compositional problems every day when we are working with, uh, for example, structural business uh, survey data, where you also have all these linear constraints, uh, but also in our output. And I think one of the th things is to name the problem uh, correctly. That's exactly what you've been doing. Uh, uh, well, one of the things that you've been doing is to point out that there is a existing theory and technology to actually handle this so uh, very interesting to me um i'll have a look in the q a and if people want to ask questions to matthias we have a few minutes so please uh, uh, don't hesitate and put questions in the in the q a um, i do see somebody who said uh, beata uh, seek who said great talk thank you so that's why you can uh, take home or keep home already um, I have a, uh, a technical question uh, while we are waiting for other questions to come in. So uh, the compositional data you have talked about, there is um, 
all the data is, is positive and there is like one sort of linear restriction. And in some of the data we work with, we have multiple linear restrictions. For example, if data is in a table, maybe you have two marginal. Structural business survey, there's a sort of system of balances. And I wonder if it's possible to uh, to extend to those cases if there if you can yep. uh, adapt or generalize the transformations uh, that you use. So if you're interested on the relative information, so uh, one component um, uh, is one component uh, dominant to, to, to another or something. Uh, if the ratios itself are interested, uh, then you can, for each of these subcomposition, you can apply a, a log ratio transformation. Uh, you will, so independently, so for each of your parts, which summing up to a whole, you apply independently a log ratio transformation. The only thing is also that, that very difficult to, this, to apply in such a transformation is very easy to apply afterwards some statistical methods that's very easy, but the interpretation is not is always a little difficult because remember you divide each part by something a geometric mean of all other parts, for example, and take the log. So it, in the re, in the in the log log ratio transformed variables, you have you have your values of 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 of, of your observation there, but divided by the rest of the others. So also the information on the rest is somewhere in in that in that ratio. And for an interpretation, you have always you always have to think about that. That's not the original data what you analyze. That's that's ratios. And for some application, that can, could be then quite quite tricky. Yeah. And typi typically, we 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 try to use some um, you know some some other balances. Like not not this. Uh, we d we don't like to apply this centered log ratio transformation, but using some isometric log ratio transformation. That would get, now go, go into too much detail, but to uh, ask yourself use case and data data specific uh, thinking, uh, it, what makes sense in your data set? Can I interpret that ratio well? So why not take the ratio of the first variable divided by the, the, the second and the third? And the other ratio could be the second variable divided by the first variable. So taking individual ratios for inter interpret so for reasons of interpretation. Okay, thanks. I see there's uh, some questions coming in. So uh, let me have a look quick. Um, I hope I pronounced the name right. Uh, René Locher uh, says you have divided your population in different regions into age groups. There is one or two regions. Um, I have to. There is, uh, there was a pop up, I'm sorry. Um, there is one or two regions out of many that has an age group which is zero. For example, there are no children below one year in a certain region. Uh, what can you do in such a case? Uh, luckily, luckily, in this data set, we didn't have zeros. But zeros are a major concern in compositional data analysis because with a zero, you cannot beat the ratio. Uh, so you have to do something. Um, one one idea is to so for such count data you um, add a small constant, not too small constant, uh, but yeah you say uh, you didn't observe a, a, a child which is one year in one region, but it could be there. So with this philosophy, because with with zeros you cannot work. So either let let the re, let this specific region out of the analysis or or you have to cheat a little bit with uh, imputing a one or something. Um, uh, Beate Sik says it's very strange that almost nobody is using these methods. I think uh, I agree. Uh, do you think it's because people are not aware of these methods or can you imagine other reasons? Yeah, people are not aware. Uh, I can tell you a story how I detected this 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 topic 
So we wrote uh, an article about cluster analysis 20 years ago and or 15 years ago and we want to publish this in, in some geochemical journal. And one reviewer was from the community of compositional data set. This is a very small community in Spain. And she said, uh, what we're doing is wrong. We have compositional data. Why do we apply classical statistical methods there, cluster analysis? And we said, what? Compositional data? Are they crazy? And 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 then we done a revision and yeah, we we was not quite well in that, that area as second revision because she insisted. And then uh, yeah, we, 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 we started to think about this problem and we needed about two years to understand the, these co concepts. So it's first that the con concepts are not so easy to understand. Then there is limitations always, as René said before, zeros always is a pain in the ass if you have zeros in the data and compositional data. Yeah, and the, all these these two restrictions so the complicated theory, but the theory is really well defined, I would say. And zeros in the data makes it not so applicable sometimes. I think that um, having uh, things like the software available so people can experiment with it will also help a lot. So that's also a great uh, contribution, even if you're not fully aware of the theory, it already can give you a feeling of what's happening where you can experiment with uh, the results. So that's a, that, I think that paves a way in for people. Um, and of, of course, there's only the R software which having methods of compositional data sets uh, included. <laughs> there's no other implementations, I, I think. Somebody sent a question also in the chat. So let me have a look. Um, Um, from Irvind. Uh, hi, Irvind. Um, he says, very interesting talk. And one question is, why is it important to smooth the data before PCA? Wouldn't the result of PCA anyway be smooth curves? No. So, so the, the, the the concept, so we, we define our data set to be functional. So basically for each age, uh, age could be continuous, we can find the, the proportion of people having exactly this age, this age. So if you want to define if, uh, so then the second thing is to compare, to compare different uh, functions as a, uh, I think it makes sense to smooth before because, um, as we saw in the first picture of these ratios, the uh, um, the polygon lines was quite unsmooth, and I think it's it's just from the general concepts of smoothness of 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 age should be somehow smooth for the population. Uh, it doesn't. It, it makes sense to smooth it the first first uh, smoothing. Is in general a good idea. So think of that uh, that you have different data sets so from Austria. Uh, in Austria, they, they, they represent the data like in 19 age groups, and in Netherlands, they represent the data in 25 age groups and different ones. So, what you do, smoothing is the only possible way uh, to make them comparable. Also, for, for different uh, if you measure some other um, data sets where you have uh, uh, measures in time, if you have different time, uh, time stamps, I would say, for two different data sets, you cannot compare it. You can only compare it if you first smooth the data and then compare. Hey, thanks. Uh, I think we are um, out of time. I see there are some other questions coming in in the chat and, and Q&A still. So, um, maybe Matthias, you could have a look and see if you can answer some of them uh, in the chat still. Thank you very much again for a very uh, interesting and wonderful talk. Uh, even though the topic was complicated, I think it was uh, quite accessible. Um, and with this, I think I'll hand over to Alex and we will move to the next uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And also thank you, Matthias, for the nice presentation. Um, 
Yeah, my job right now is basically only to hand over to Nicoletta, who is actually chairing the next session, and I will also assign the next presenter uh, role. Uh, Nicoletta, please start the session. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, before I start the next session, uh, I uh, uh, would like to thanks to Matthias for uh, the great presentation to us. Uh, thank you, uh, Matthias. Uh, uh, and now we have the third session, uh, scientific session uh, named Dissemination and Visualization. Uh, every participant uh, have, um, has um, uh, 15 minutes to talk and uh, th uh, three or two uh, or five minutes uh, to uh, have discussion on the, at the end. Uh, the first presentation is uh, taken by uh, Sebastian Ruiz Santa Cruz, researching at Shanghai University. Uh, revisiting Rogers and Castro's multi-exponential model migration schedule. So, Sebastian? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, you okay. have the floor. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sebastian Ruiz Santa Cruz. I'm in this moment an adjunct researcher at the Asian Demographic Research Institute at Shanghai University, and uh, it's a partner of. Um, I'm also partner of the external university in Colombia. I'm doing this uh, branch of the work uh, with Maulín Villarreal Fuentes, which is working at the International Labour Organization. And she is advising me to give more um, content to, to my results, uh, uh, given, given from the PhD thesis I made uh, one year ago. So uh, let's start uh, saying why uh, the migration age schedule is important. And uh, it's important because, because it, it describes the migration age pattern associated with to selectivity <clears throat> as an interaction of uh, push and pull factors in origin and destination areas. So uh, it is also um, allows visual comparisons about the intensity and the migrant population general structure. So for demographers are um, describing structures of population, it's the most important thing and also for describing the uh, migrant uh, structure uh, as a um, component of the labor uh, market is also important. So <clears throat> the model uh, it estimates um, a migration schedule based on uh, exponential curves uh, that belongs to a demographic behavior. We will see later uh, in in a slide, we have uh, how it, uh, it it is composed, um, and give us uh, some uh, demo economic parameters, uh, and those economic uh, demo economic uh, I called um, relates to labor force participation. So um, it is important to to describe these uh, parameters in the in the model. Uh, other alternatives are. Um, kernel smoothing uh, uh, that uh, the, the institutes uh, used uh, to to implement to sometimes to uh, model the migration schedule and also to estimate sometimes um, uh, curves before um, under uh, five uh, years old. So and this model can also uh, be uh, used for that. Other definitions uh, in in the in the model uh, have been taken recently by uh, Tom Wilson in Australia uh, to describe the post retirement curve. Um, so, um, following some um, theories that the, there is uh, people migrating at the end of the life, and 
Oh, uh, other options as well are non-parametric non uh, measures of this curve based on um, um, some um, parameters. Uh, I, mean, I mean, created uh, by by the form of the curve instead of being like uh, mathematical parameters. So um, the uses uh, has been uh, taken by many years in some countries uh, that still. Uh, methods to smooth and grasp the mean behavior of the migration calendar. And there are opportunities also to estimate, as I said, uh, children under the five years old. Uh, however, we have to be careful because we need to see um, some kind of uh, historical um, data and take in carefully because sometimes the um, under five are overestimated with the model. So we have to be careful with the empirical data. And, and uh, also uh, population projections needs sometimes a smoothing and also project uh, those parameters to see how labor force is incorporated. So it is used to, to theoretically uh, for that in, in, and in some papers they are trying and contradicting as well. So we will see why we are revising this model. So, the general model or the more complete model is a 13 model parameter. However, it, it has um, four, four models. We have four models. Um, one with seven, nine, 11, and 13 parameters. And um, most of the, uh, of the curves describe uh, migration. If you can see the, my, my, my pointer, um, <laughs> we, we can see that uh, this is, um, for example, the, the, the curve that describes the infant migration and the, the other curve describes the labor force migration. And, and then this will describe uh, the um, uh, retirement peak migration and so on. If we have more parameters, we will see that it, it, it is going upwards or downwards and, and we will describe it with another explanation. So uh, in, in the, in the uh, original paper, they called um on until those parameters and the until thing however with the uh, initial value problem we have here because this is a, a made by an optimization um we will we will have to choose uh one initial value so we, we said why this value and it, it, it just started in the paper and in the paper just said uh these are these are the initial values and i said okay well, but what happened if we change it uh, all, all those initial values for this optimization and, and and then calculate those parameters and then other parameters which are the ratios which seems to me more stable and more uh, accurate to to give like a discourse to the to the labor force and and and, and the and the, uh, in the labor uh, in, oh sorry um, international labor organization can, can use it in, in some way so how, how we did it um first of all we did a rate calculation uh for for the migra migration rate right <clears throat> so we have the emig immigrants and then we have the population in, in the denominator from five years ago uh, by age and, and and sex we can have it um this is not taking into account mortality it's just uh, to, to have this uh, exercise. And then we have a kernel smooth on, on, the, on those uh, rates to help the model uh, to fit. Uh, how, however, we can do, do it without it. But in this case, I, I, I did it to, to help the model because some in, the, in, in, in this case, we will see we have a lot of variance. So I did it just for that reason. And then we will just uh, take the mean square error and the mean absolute uh, percentile error and see which is the minimum. We simulate one value at a time for each parameter. Uh, saying uh, that this is uh, Bayesian thinking is not a Bayesian method. A Bayesian method is not, you know, it's not Bayesian, but it's a patient thinking. Like we, we don't know, so we have a prior, like uniform prior. We don't know anything about the parameter. So we developed um, with a colleague, with another colleague, before previously to this uh, 
uh, this ongoing project, we, we developed a, a, a package in R. It's, it's already on, on a GitHub, so you can download it and place your issues as well. And it's based on an S3 class. So we use a method um, and a oriented uh, program programming. So we, we use a method and then uh, we establish this method, which is a linear regression. Uh, we we take the logarithm of the of the curve and then we perform a lo um, linear regression. But then you can you know you play with these uh, functions and then this is like the whole example. They're taking 200 uh, iterations and um, and for this is for uh, a Spanish migration, the Asian specific uh, migration rate and. Uh, then you, you can see the class here in the, in the R uh, model. Uh, and then you, you can take the, the parameters out like you usually you do in R. Uh, this is the function breast mode uh, to, uh, which uh, adjust this, uh, like doing almost a, a, a loop, just t taking uh, the uh, calculated gradient if, if we, the function doesn't have it, so this to discard it. Oh, okay, you can just, um, Go into the, the the website and and see how we develop and then I plot it now which is here in the plot and uh, and then you can you can see which is the best map or M A P A M in Spanish <laughs> um, and in in under R square so you can uh, because those measures are, are given by the USSP uh, the International Union for the Scientific Study of the Population. And in the website, and say they say you can take both to check which is better. Uh, and okay, in this case, let's say it's the 13. However, we, it's 200 simulations. We can do it with uh, 100,000. And as I did it for the exercise. So the application results. Um, as, uh, uh, I will just uh, um, show a little bit of the package. Uh, you can see it here. Um, I did the same thing I'm showing you, um, and this is uh, the the, the uh, exercise I, I did in, when, when I was doing my PhD. Uh, I, I did this, this shiny, and and you can see this uh, from from the Argentina to Bolivia. So you can you just change it here, and yeah, uh, take Colombia, and yeah, you can just take it. You just will see standardized migration rates and uh, and so on. And then uh, we we just uh, realized that everything ended uh, with this method and the, everything ended up in one, 11 or 15 parameters, more or less 115 curves out of um, 139. Uh, and uh, many curves doesn't fit because of the, at, the, at the beginning of the curve of or so many curves, uh, there was another peak. So may, mm, that I'm, I'm, I'm like proving now testing if there is a child migration delay. So we are testing, we will see in the other things. Um, it can be a, a mechanism of migration, like like pioneering, pioneerism. Um, um, and we will see that it's a worse estimation of the retirement peak because the uh, exponential curves are like eating so the, the, the function with this method. So we'll have this. Um, Example for Argentina to Bolivia and Colombia to Venezuela um, for men and women. And the, the first thing we, we can check here is that, sorry, I, I will go back. Um, in, the, in this case, always, uh, but under the theoretical, theoretical model, uh, th this is l l less than this. And here, uh, the results are showing uh, with that, that we can, uh, like, switch sometimes uh, and yeah there's like weird results on on the, on on those for for women and male um and and it, it is not always less the, uh, the the mean peak so then we check the uh, with the initial values and the uh, mean square error at the end and we check that uh, those uh, parameters are not uh, really significant. Uh, and in, this is for many, many models. And 
in many, many models, they are not significant into the uh, optimization. So we are like kind of re-evaluating re the, the model, like theoretical model. This is not the mean peak of, of migration. This is just a parameter in our optimization. So we can see like the final parameters, the distributions, and this is helping us to construct uh, priors, like beta priors for, for next uh, steps, like uh, in, a, in a model, we we'll see. So those are the uh, the levels, say two, and two, four, then the, the all the parameters for those ones, and the location parameters, I told that they are following something like a normal or something like this. And then you, with the, with those all those parameters, I, I constructed an, a typology uh, for for Latin America, and we can see that Latin America has uh, two, four four regions, let's say, four kind of countries that migrate with one with more labor and postponed the retirement, uh, one with more infant dependency and more asymmetric curve, uh, one with labor curve and extended labor ages, and one with the asymmetry and age migration. And Bastian? Yeah, tell me. Please, two minutes more. Okay. And maybe conclude. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will conclude. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so we, we can say, like, uh, as a whole, uh, we can say that the, the more child dependency and, and in this system, the less is the symmetry of the curve. So this implies that uh, uh, maybe it's more labor migration, more aged labor migration that are bringing uh, more child, uh, uh, more children, sorry. What, what is important to ILO is because uh, to establish historical measures, the project uh, could be part of a country classification. Uh, and uh, the, the best part is we can know now something from the uh, statistical registers and uh, uh, can we replace is the question uh, something uh, from the statistical registers uh, from labor uh, surveys uh, in, in countries and the ongoing work as i told uh, that this is uh, with the statistics colombia and uh, some with the treasury colombia as well with the uh, administrative registers uh, the hierarchical model to incorporate beta priors and some inputs and combining with the information from ILO stats, the bulk of uh, we have. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you a lot, Sebastian. Of course, the migration is very challenging issue every time. If our, uh, there are questions in the Q and A section, uh, or not? Uh, if people want to, would like to write something to Sebastian, please uh, use the, the Q and A question. Thank you again. Uh, okay, thank you, Sebastian. We move now to the second presentation uh, to a um, close friend of the Euros conference, uh, five in uh, Langsrud. Uh, from Statistic uh, Norway uh, with the presentation of sparse matrix tool in R for multidimensional hierarchical aggregation. So, Paivin, please, you have the floor now. Yes, then I try to share. You see it? You hear me? Yes, 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 we can see it and hear yes. it. Yes, I'm Eivind Langstry from Statistics Norway. I'm, an, I'm a senior researcher at the, the, the Division for Methods. And today I will talk about functionality for multidimensional hierarchical aggregation. And <clears throat> this is implemented in R, in the package SSP tools available on CRAP. And the main function is hierarchy compute. And I will start by looking at the web page from Statistics Norway, and I want to find data about uh, municipal accounts in the so-called stat bank. And, and 
to specify a table, I have done some uh, selections, contents, year 2019, some regions, two accounting scopes, a function within primary and secondary school, and type sick pay uh, reimbursement. And the result is a table with some accounting figures. And if you look at the underlying data, you can say that we have six dimensions. One year, since uh, we look at one year at a time, uh, 462 uh, municipalities, two accounting categories, two accounting scopes, 208 function codes defined by a hierarchy, 208 type codes defined by a hierarchy, <coughs> and the challenge is to compute uh, for all the 84 million uh, combinations, comp compute values for all the uh, 84 million uh, combinations, and even if 90% uh, of them are zero. And uh, from an input file with about 800,000 combinations. And in input uh, function and type codes are from the lowest hierarchy level. And the missing combinations in uh, input is treated as uh, zero. And uh, to do the computations, uh, hierarchy specifications for function and type are needed. And this was, in fact, an actual challenge because uh, within a modernization project, uh, the, the plan was to do the computations using an implementation of the validation and the transformation language. And this turned out to be too inefficient. inefficient. And I was asked to try to solve the problem using R. So I call this the 80 million challenge. And a problem is that these hierarchies are messy. And to describe the methodology, uh, I will first look at a simple hierarchy, uh, which can be described by three formulas. Europe is EU plus non-EU, EU is Portugal plus Spain, and non-EU is uh, Iceland. And the information in the formulas uh, can also be written in the table like this. And the column with levels means that you need to compute EU and non-EU first, and then Europe. And uh, the hierarchy can also be described using the standards in STC table or PAL Argus. Uh, but the formula specification on the right side are more general. A tree structure is not needed. The sign can be negative and these can be called free hierarchies. A simple example is to specify Europe and uh, EU and non-EU in another way, like this. Europe is the sum of Iceland, Portugal, and Spain. So the direction of the arrow is important. And in addition, the color is important. This is due to specify a negative sign. EU is Europe minus non-EU. And the first part of the computation process is to make a dummy hierarchy matrix from the hierarchy specification. Input codes are columns, and these are found in the maps from uh, in the row where the level is one. And to create a dummy hierarchy matrix, the algorithm contains a matrix multiplication for each level. And the levels can be found automatically. And here, both these specifications give the same dummy hierarchy matrix. Input codes can also be included as rows and then a parameter input in output is true. But I will use false here. So this is the geographic hierarchy. 
And in the first example, I will also consider a very simple H hierarchy. Now input in, in output is true, so the codes young and old are both in inputs and outputs. This information is input to the function hierarchy computes. And in addition, uh, we have an input data set. And so uh, this is how it looks in practice. The input data, the function call, and the output data. An output is computed from inputs by a matrix multiplication. So a model matrix is involved or the transpose of a model matrix. And now about how this model matrix is created. The final model matrix is the result of crossing a separate model matrix for each hierarchy. And each is a dummy hierarchy matrix extended to match the data. So at the bottom here, we have uh, the young column replicated three times. And crossing is done by the column wise Kronecker product. And now an extended example where year is an extra dimension without the hierarchy. It's just a factor uh, specified by row factor. And here there are two hierarchies and one factor, uh, but in general, uh, there are no limits to the number of hierarchies and factors. So, this is the computations behind the scenes. And by using dots instead of zeros, it's easier to look at the matrix. Uh, and since the sparse matrices are used, uh, the zeros are not stored in the memory. Now on stage again, I'm back to the extended example. Now we change the specification from uh, for year from row factor to call factor. Output is, is the same, uh, but uh, column order can differ. And now computations behind the scenes, now they are different. And reorganizing to wider formats can improve efficiency. And by specifying the output parameter, it's possible to see the matrices Holes uh, may occur because of incomplete inputs, and these are filled with zeros. And to solve the 80 million challenge, region was specified as call factor. And now we take a look at these messy hierarchies. The function hierarchy it's not a simple T structure, and uh, we also have a few red arrows, which means negative signs. And the type hierarchy. So here we have a lot of red arrows. And the 80 million channels was sold in 20 seconds seconds on my old laptop and half of the time was used to reorganize the results. And I will just mention some extensions and spin-offs after mission completed. It's possible to compute only some selected combinations. Duplicates can be handled in different ways. Two-way computation is possible. Uh, the model matrix can be the primary output, like this, and combination with a formula is also possible. Hierarchies can be specified in several ways. And 
it's possible to use model matrices within statistical control tools. And this is the case for the package small count round. And here are some snapshots from the vignette. Hierarchies uh, are input and uh, model matrices are computed in the background. And finally, the conclusion, I have talked about sparse matrix tools in R, in R packets SSP tools. I use sparse matrices according to the matrix package. And then you don't waste memory to store all the zeros. The function is hierarchy computes. And there are other functions uh, according to the previous slide. Thank you. Thank you, Fahim. Um, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, there are no uh, questions yet in the Q&A section, but uh, I have one for you. <laughs> um, I, it, it is very technical um, uh, presentation, and I would like to know more about the application in uh, statistical offices. Uh, could you please uh, give us more details about or uh, examples uh, for um, uh, statistical institute? Thank you. Uh, this uh, this was uh, developed because of very specific uh, computations within a specific era in statistics Norway. So that was the reason why it was made. And this was uh, very important for statistics Norway. It's this within this uh, account uh, computations. So, uh, but afterwards, I, I realized that uh, this functionality was also very could also be used for other things, uh, especially the creation of these uh, matrices from hierarchies that uh, can be used within the statistical disclosure uh, tools. But uh, you can also imagine other areas. But uh, what I have been involved in so far is, is this uh, starting point with this uh, accounting uh, computations. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here. Um, this is a really nice tool. Uh, are there any plans to read standard hierarchical classification like those in SDMX registers? Can, can you repeat? Are there any plans to read standard hierarchical classification <sighs> like to, uh, those in SDMX registers? I'm not... Uh... I have not know the details about those registers, but uh, w once you read some classifications, you can always transform them into this other format. And, uh, and uh, so it's the question of transforming this classification into a uh, hierarchy specifications that can be used. So, so I think it's uh, very possible to use it in, in many ways. Thank you. If there are no more questions, thank you. Thank you again, uh, Fivind, for your thank presentation. You. We move forward on the next uh, presenter. Um, we uh, talked to Julian Kramer from uh, University of Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, we uh, presentation analysis of trajectories into retirement using the Danish labor market register. So, uh, Julian? Yes. You, you I have will the floor. Share my screen. Can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can see it and okay. we can hear it. Great. Uh, yeah, right. So what I'm going to present is uh, research uh, using actually two methods to analyze trajectories into retirements uh, for the labor, Danish labor market registry. Uh, 
so the Danish Labour Market Registry is uh, one of the few longitudinal uh, registries that uh, Denmark Statistics uh, maintains, uh, and it contains uh, labour market statuses of all individuals living in Denmark uh, on a monthly basis. So what you see in the slide is uh, an example, so a simulated example of how this um, registry looks like. Uh, and you see that for each month, uh, we have one or multiple labor market statuses for individuals, uh, and also noting the amount of hour that uh, our set this individual was in this status in each month, as well as the start and end date. Now, we're not going to use the entire labor market registry, but as I've already said, we decided to focus on trajectories uh, into retirement. Uh, and that was inspired by the fact that in Denmark, um, a policy reform in the so-called early retirement pension uh, was made in 2006. Uh, and this policy reform basically uh, meant that the eligibility age for receiving such a pension was increased slowly. So everyone uh, with the date of birth before 1954 uh, could make use of this early retirement pension from age 60 onwards. Uh, but individuals born uh, at a later age, uh, you can see uh, later uh, year, this was uh, age was slowly increased uh, until it's finally related in computation in relation to life expectancy. Um, so as I've said, we've uh, decided to investigate two methods to try to, to look at this data and see what how what use these methods could be. Uh, and the first method that we decided to look at is so-called sequence analysis. Um, now in sequence analysis, uh, what is done is that we have sequences of observed states for a set of individuals. So in our case, um, we decided to look at individuals uh, from uh, age 58, so the month they turn 58, until the month they turn 63. And we decided to look at individuals born in 1950 and born in 1954. And for those individuals, we look at their labor market state, uh, which could be one of five. Uh, so either they're full-time employed, part-time employed, uh, outside the labor market, uh, which basically means unemployed, uh, they could have received pension or uh, they could uh, be deceased. Uh, and we thus have 60 of those labor market statuses because we follow each individual for 60 months. Uh, and you can then make a kind of plot as you see in the slides. So here we see an example of the labor market states uh, of 10 individuals from the 1950 cohort. Um, and we call these uh, observations, we call those sequences. So as you can see, for example, individual number two and individual number five here, uh, we're receiving pension already for the entire uh, period. Uh, so this could, for example, be a disability pension because the individuals uh, were already receiving that before age 60. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, individuals 10 and individual three uh, were full-time employed for most of the observation period. Now, the idea of sequence analysis is that we sort of try to compare all of these sequences. So we compute different scores that indicate how much the sequences differ from each other. Uh, and then uh, we try to cluster these differences so that we get, get a, a set of typical, in this case, labor market trajectories uh, for this specific cohort. So if we do that, if we complete, compute differences between all pairs of sequences in our data set and subsequently run uh, a cluster analysis uh, using R, uh, so there are several packages that you can use, uh, but we use the, the trial miner package, uh, which is especially useful if you have a social type of uh, data and not, for example, DNA sequences. And if you do that, uh, then this is the, the type of output that you can get. So here we, we uh, specified in the cluster analysis that we wanted it to output uh, six uh, clusters, uh, and in this case, six typical uh, labor market trajectories uh, for the uh, 1950 cohort. Uh, and the labels that we gave all of these clusters, those are the ones that we made up ourselves. 
So for example, the largest cluster here uh, contains 20,000 individuals from, that were born in 1950. And that's the cluster on the bottom right. Uh, and we said uh, we need, give this the name full-time late pension because as you can see, uh, most of the individuals in this cluster were full-time employed for the entire observation period. Uh, and at around age 62 here, uh, a small part of them decided or uh, started receiving uh, some kind of pension payments. Uh, and then with relation to this uh, early uh, retirement pension, uh, you can see these two clusters uh, on the top and in the middle right, uh, which contains individuals that at age 60 uh, decided to make use of, most likely decided to make use of this early retirement pension because you see a sharp increase in the proportion of individuals uh, that are receiving that pension uh, for both these clusters. Now we can do the same thing for all individuals born in 1954. So remember those individuals, for those individuals, the, there was a change in the eligibility age for early retirement pension. And you really clearly see that also in these uh, typologies. So, so the way the typologies look doesn't really change that much, but for these two early pension categories, you clearly see that there is no sharp decrease at age 60 anymore in the amount of individuals receiving pension, but that decrease starts at a later time point. So at age 60.5 uh, and at age 61. So that's, you can see back in these kinds of typologies, uh, the effect of the, the policy reform in early retirement pension age. Uh, but one thing that you, you can't do with this kind of analysis um, is if we want to model uh, the time to pension. So we show that there are differences in when people start receiving pension funds, but we can't model an individual effect on when, when uh, you, you retire. Uh, so in order to do that, we looked at another type of model, which is uh, called joint models for longitudinal and survival data. Uh, so why would did we decide to look at that? Uh, and what is it? So basically, uh, this type of joint model means that we're uh, combining uh, two outcomes, one longitudinal outcome and one time to event outcome. And in our case, uh, the time to event outcome is the, the time to retirement. So we're interested in modeling the retirement hazard and we model that jointly with the longitudinal outcome, which in our case is a labor market state. Uh, so that's either full, being full-time employed, being part-time employed, or being outside the labor market. Uh, so for simplicity, we left out the, the death state because in that case, we would have two time to event outcomes. So the longitudinal outcome is modeled using a hierarchical uh, multinomial uh, model. You can see here to model the probability of having a certain labor market status. And we do that using a set of covariates X, um, which can either be time varying or fixed. Uh, and we have a random intercept. So each individual has their own probability of being full-time, part-time uh, employed or outside the labor market. Um, and we do the same thing in a, the time to event model. So we have a proportional hazard type model with a set of covariates again, uh, and this UI, which is a random frailty, so basically a random effect, uh, and each individual has their own uh, retirement hazard. Um, so we have two submodels, and these submodels have to be linked in a certain way because we might be interested in the link between the retirement hazard and the probability of uh, having a certain labor market status. And then in our case, we decided to model that using a joint uh, multivariate normal distribution for the random intercepts and the frailties. So we are basically modeling uh, a covariance or a correlation between the random intercepts of, for example, being full-time employed and the frailty, so the retirement hazard. So why this and why not more simple survival kind of model, for example, a crop proportional hazard model, and that's basically because the retirement hazard and the labor market status are endogenous variables. And if we would use a cost proportional hazards model, a simple survival model, uh, we would have bias because of that. 
Uh, to other reasons which are not uh, necessarily present in our data set are if you might have non-random dropout in a longitudinal outcome or measurement error, uh, then such a joint model can also correct from bias caused by these issues. Uh, so in R, we implemented this model as a patient type model, and that's uh, a really nice package with which you can do that, which is also very flexible in terms of specifying your own models, is the R stand package. Uh, so that's the way in which we implemented this. Um, and then the results, uh, as you know, as you have seen, uh, this, the joint model consists actually of two submodels and then this link. So we have a submodel for the longitudinal part, the, the labor market status, a submodel for the retirement hazard, and we have this joint uh, variance covariance matrix. So our results also come in three parts. So first of all, we can look at fixed effects of covariates for the survival submodel. Um, so in our case, we included <clears throat> two uh, covariates, um, sex uh, and education level. They're both categorical covariates. Um, and we can then get uh, hazard ratios together with credible intervals, because uh, it's Bayesian analyses for both of the cohorts. Uh, so note that we uh, did uh, two separate analyses for both cohorts, uh, but of course a better analysis would be to include them in the same uh, model. And here we see that uh, maybe not unexpectedly for, for these cohorts is that uh, the hazard ratio of sex is larger than one, in this case meaning that uh, the retirement hazard for females is larger than that of males. So basically females uh, um, tend to retire earlier. Um, and the hazard ratio for education is, at least in the 1954 cohort, uh, lower than one, meaning that a higher education level leads to a lower retirement hazard. Then the longitudinal sub model, so that was a multinomial hierarchical model, uh, which means uh, that we can get uh, odds ratios uh, back from our analysis. And note that the credible intervals here are for the coefficient uh, and not for the odds ratio. Uh, and we then have two parts in the output, one for the odds of full-time employment versus being outside the labor market, and one for the odds of part-time employment versus being outside the labor market. And again, uh, we have an effect of sex and education, and in this model, we, we have an intercept as well. Uh, so what you see is that uh, for uh, the probability of being full-time employed, there is a negative effect of sex, meaning that uh, females have a lower probability of being full-time employed than males, uh, which makes sense for, for these cohorts. Uh, for part-time uh, employment, the effect of sex is positive, but not um, significant, as you can see. Uh, and then the effect of education, uh, again, is also positive, meaning that the probability of being full-time uh, or, in fact, part-time employed in the 1954 cohort is larger for individuals that have a higher uh, education level. But actually, what is maybe most interesting for, uh, for this type of model is that we can uh, relate the labor market status uh, to the retirement hazard. So what you see in this table are correlations between the random intercepts of being full-time employed for the probability of being full-time employed and part-time employed, uh, but also between that random intercept and the frailty, uh, so the, the retirement hazard. And you see that, as expected, if your probability of being full-time employed is larger, your probability of being part-time employed is also larger. So you see the positive correlation coefficient. This is the mean of the posterior distribution. Um, and you see, but you see that uh, if your probability of being full-time or part-time employed is larger, your retirement hazard becomes, becomes smaller, as you can see in this smaller uh, or, or negative correlation coefficient. Uh, and what is interesting to see is that uh, this correlation is actually larger for uh, the correlation between uh, full-time employment and uh, the retirement hazard than part-time employment, meaning that if you're full-time employed, uh, your chance of or your hazard of retiring is is much is 
lower than if you're part-time employed. Uh, and these final three lines are the standard deviations of the random intercepts and the frailty. And this basically represents the variation that we have in our population in uh, the probability of being full-time or part-time employed or in the retirement hazard. Uh, so concluding, uh, if we try to compare these two analysis methods, they're actually quite different, uh, both in the way they, they typify the trajectories. So if you look at sequence analysis, you get quite detailed uh, trajectories. Uh, you see both in the duration and the pattern that it can distinguish between groups of people. Um, so sequence analysis is therefore also called a more holistic method, whereas the joint model is a very model-based method, um, and the typification of the trajectories is not that detailed, but on the other hand, we do get coefficient estimates. So if we want to test hypotheses on effects of certain covariates, then that might be a better method to use. Uh, on the inclusion of covariates, you've seen that I've included those in the joint model, uh, but also in sequence analysis, it's possible to look at whether males or females, for example, are more likely to end up in uh, a different uh, cluster, for example, but it's harder there to include covariates in the models. Uh, and then a negative thing about actually both methods is in the computation. So sequence analysis requires a lot of working memory because it needs to complete it's to compute differences between all pairs of sequences. So if you have a lot of individuals and a lot of uh, time points, then this becomes very memory intensive. Um, and then joint models, because we've implemented it in a Bayesian way, uh, they take quite a lot of computation time. So the analysis that I've shown you are not based on the entire cohorts, but a subsample of those cohorts. Uh, and we've been trying to uh, implement some, to try to run those in parallel uh, which is hard for Bayesian analyses, but we've implemented a method with uh, which you can split your data into several data set, data smaller data sets, analyze those separately in parallel, and then combine the results after, um, and implement that in an R package uh, that's called WASPR. Yes, so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jolien. Very yes. interesting. Uh, I'm personally uh, interested in your uh, presentation um, and um, I would like to ask uh, if you have some results, which is the best time to pension? Well, I just, uh, no, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have results on that. I would, that would mean a more, lot more detailed analysis. So the idea here was to sort of try to look at uh, different methods that, that could be used uh, using the, the pension uh, as an, a sort of example. Uh, yeah. So no, <laughs> I don't have an answer to that. I can wait. I can wait to, to, to see some results. And the second question uh, um, is related to inclusion of the co covariates. Um, do you intend to um, use more covariates in the models? Um, I, I don't know, maybe the health status of the person or others? Yeah. yeah, so actually including the health status would be very interesting and actually would lead to maybe a joint model of actually three variables because you, you'd imagine that it's health status influences both when you go on pension, but uh, also the timing of pension will probably influence your health afterwards because working might have negative effects on your health as well. Uh, yeah, so we're working on, on stuff like that as well, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Julian. Yes. And uh, now we move forward for the last presentation of our session. Uh, Konrad, the uh, Ober Wimmer from the yes. IQS um, Institute des Bundes für Qualitas, I don't know German, <laughs> from Austria. So please present yourself. You have the floor now. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. You will have the English title on the presentation. May I just ask for the thumbs up that you can hear and me and see the presentation? Very well, thank you very much. 
So I hope before our lunchtime break, you have got something easy to stomach for everybody. I will just uh, give you an insight on how we do things when it comes to automation uh, in the calculation and presentation of our educational indicators. Uh, in Austria, the now EQS is responsible for the national and international assessment of student learning outcomes. International assessment is, of course, PISA, Pearls and Timbs, and all the studies that the whole world knows now. The national assessment is the assessment of our national educational standards. That's the Bildungsstandards. And uh, both types of assessments are defined by law in Austria. So we are government agency that provides uh, official statistics that also the education administration, for example, uses in its decision making. Our predecessor organizations, there were several, but mostly it was the BIFI, have done this since 2000 with the first PISA study and always providing conventional reports, follow-up analysis and compact overviews and so on. Also, educational indicators were provided for the national education reports that uh, were um, reduced in 2009 up to 2018, every three years. And this was um, the first um, publication where also all statistical coefficients were provided in supplement data sheets online. But we saw a lot of limitations with this uh, linear form of presentation with these text-based um, forms that led to the development of a database of educational indicators in 2019. Mostly when you produce reports for such a long time period, there are so many uh, PDFs and texts now on our website that it's hard to find anything. And of course, even all the data we want to uh, show um, again, and make, um, make it possible to find it for trends. So the goals for this new database of educational indicators were provide a global and public entry point to our statistics, facilitate the exploring of contents, but also give the possibility to compare and combine results from different studies and even different data sources so that a secondary analysis are facilitated. And also very important nowadays that we have so much data and so much so much analysis uh, is that citation uh, is possible and uh, stays uh, the same uh, over times. This we do by permanent designations of indicators now. There were two major restrictions in this development project. The first was, was it had limited manpower and resources. We were a group of about uh, six people who did this but only corresponding to about three full-time equivalents. And we needed very quick results in the time period of nine months development time, uh, because we already promised, promised this to the federal government that the then BV, now EQS, would have such a database. So I will give you a very short uh, static tour. Uh, you can follow the link on the title of the presentation um, to get to this indicator database, of course. Here is a quick study uh, static uh, screenshot. We organized indicators in a tree-like structure. Um, at first, you will select the general type of, of indicator, then a criterion. This is some state or trend of the school system that you would like to monitor or know something about. And then, of course, a year or time period uh, for which this uh, information is away labeled. Optionally, the information may be split up by uh, up to two variables, some regional or demographical subgroups. Um, this depends on the concrete criterion and the data source, uh, um, which are available here. And for example, this would be the highest parental uh, education or the uh, degree of organization um, of, the school, of the schools. Um, there is a semi-dynamical behavior. Uh, the image you see, for example, on the right side, uh, and uh, meta information and also links for, for downloading of the image and of spreadsheets are just fetched from the server after you uh, make your decisions. 
So the contents exist beforehand and no calculations are done by the web application. I will uh, explain why this happened um, a bit further down the road. Along with the graph that you have seen, you get all coefficients and some supplemental information like standard errors and absolute frequencies um, as Excel spreadsheets with the highest possible numerical pre precision still preserved. So this is uh, very good for, for, for usage in secondary analysis uh, that you still have um, the highest numerical precisions and do your own calculations on that. For example, the image you saw would translate to this Excel spreadsheet when you download it from the indicator database. So when we um, set up the project and we had our first project meetings, knowing the restrictions in manpower and also in time, uh, we felt that there were two distinct groups talking uh, to each other. It may be a bit stereotypical now, but uh, we felt on the one side, we had the social scientists that wanted to think about the content, uh, what to show to the public, what statistics to make available, that anticipated a lot of different indicators from different data sources. Besides the assessment data, we also have um, um, exclusive uh, access to some uh, official data uh, concerning where uh, students um, attend and what, uh, what educations they attend. Uh, the social scientists are also concerned with the validity, of course, with quality assurance, the meaning of the indicators and what the impact might be. Might be so they were interested uh, to give uh, meta information so that uh, users can uh, actually interpret statistics uh, in the right way. The social scientists feared disclosure. This is always a, a very dif a difficult topic in, in Austria because we monitor the school system very cl closely and our national assessment is not a sample, but uh, we, I'm sorry, I seem to have difficult, technical difficulties. Is it the same with the audience? Do you still see the presentation? Okay, yes, but it, it, it may be lagging. I, I don't know what it is right now. I'm, I'm forced to be at home because of quarantine. Usually it works fine, but uh, I'm sorry if it doesn't work that good. I think I will um, just continue. Um, yes, because um, our national assessments are not sampled, uh, you could very easily identify single persons or single groups of persons, so privacy is uh, of a big issue for us. Uh, the social scientists also use R, but no other programming languages. On the other hand, the programmers, of course, need to have clear goals and clear specifications. They didn't want to reprogram the web application very often. Uh, that's understandable. They can't anticipate all exceptions uh, to the rules that we had in mind, with we uh, designate the social scientists, uh, and they rely on the social scientists uh, for requirements to privacy to be fulfilled. That's not their area of expertise. The programmers uh, in our software engineering department usually don't use R, but all kinds of other programming languages. So I seem to have problems switching to the next slide. So I think it worked. Um, so we decided uh, the whole part of producing the content, the JPEGs for the graphs and the Excel spreadsheets, as well as the meta information, should stay with the social scientists. And they are responsible for validation, for the quality assurance, and the checks for possible violations of privacy, and to do all that in R. While the programmers, of course, develop a web application, take responsibility uh, for usability and maintenance, and publish whenever we need them to publish new indicators. And there's only a loose definition of interactions between these two groups. So, I will focus on what and how are we doing uh, the uh, generation of the indicators in R. Uh, for every group of similar indicators, we have a separate R project 
because the needs to uh, calculate something or uh, how we um, visualize it are quite different. And in all of this project, there are basically uh, three steps that you could perhaps uh, split up in uh, three R files. First is the calculation uh, of the estimates, validation, and concerns of privacy. The second part would produce the spreadsheets for download, and the third part would draw the graphs. After um, having um, set up several of these uh, projects for several groups of indicators, we could um, abstract a project template, um, design some helper functions that almost any uh, project would use, and uh, set up some coding guidelines. On the other hand, these uh, uh, this, uh, projects um, communicate uh, very intensely with an SQL database that stores meta information on the indicators, indicators, but also tracks the progress uh, of publishing um, and provides text templates or information where data sources are stored and so on. Now I will tend to all three parts, uh, especially the first and the last one. The calculation for our uh, education indicators happens with Beefy Survey. This is a package uh, already developed with the or in the predecessor organization by my former colleague Alexander Robic um, and I. It calculates estimates and standards error for the reporting in large scale assessments that conform to the OECD and EIA standards. This is what uh, we are obliged to do by our scientific board. And we also uh, want to facilitate this, of course. Uh, and we have uh, some uh, own definitions for the assessment of building standards in Austria. Uh, Beefy Survey can also cope with them. Beefy Survey as a package is faster and easier to use uh, than other packages like Survey or MI tools. Um, the code that does the calculations runs in native C. That's much, much faster than R. Um, and to make it easy to use, there is only one line of code to encapsulate the data and the data structure parameters, like weights, uh, replicate weights, check knife zones, plausible values, multiple imp imputed uh, values, or whatever might be in there in the data. Um, it does this by combining all these things uh, into an object of class EFI data and all the following um, functions for estimating and calculating uh, just use this object. For example, you see such a function call to the function data at the bottom of the slide. Uh, here I would uh, set as an input the 10, 10 imputed data sets uh, from the baseline study of the building standards. Uh, that's just a list. I would define a weight which stood and I would provide several vectors for 132 replicate weights from the jackknife procedure. Afterwards, afterwards, there are easy to use functions for typical reporting needs, frequencies, univariate statistics, correlations, and so on. Uh, in the example, you see um, frequencies by the means of the function bv.frequency. Uh, we pass on the bv object and then just select which variables we want to have frequencies for, and also a list of grouping variables so that we get split results. Beefy Survey can also handle uh, more complex models, but uh, this is not usually the case for our official statistics. Moreover, Beefy Survey has a standardized output format for results. Estimates and standard errors are always um, provided in a long table format. And this makes it possible to write very easy help with helper functions concerning privacy. We check all our statistics for k-anonymity. We don't want to provide um, any estimate for a group of size uh, below five, because again, it's not in the national assessment, it's not the sample. You might perhaps know the four people of a distinct uh, demographic group, and we don't want to share the information uh, for such um, small groups. 
And we also check for seri zero variants and also um, categories that have a hundred a uh, hundred percent um, for any given group, uh, so that you um, can't uh, distinguish from what uh, can't uh, from come from one uh, result to result of people of the group that are all similar. Um, what I didn't mention is um, all of these uh, functions that we use here are very suitable for um, interaction with an SQL uh, database where you just fetch uh, which variables uh, you want to get results for and what are the grouping variables. So in a big loop, we can uh, very easily calculate results for a huge number of indicators. I won't uh, lose many words on um, producing the spreadsheets with open XLSX. I will just point my opinion, this is now the best package for creating XLSX right now, at least for the needs that we have. The last part was the trickiest. Um, it was to produce graphs that not only are informative and are hopefully good looking, but also uh, are conform to our corporate design. This is now that we are actually um, an agency of the federal uh, ministry for education itself. This is more, uh, more than before now an issue that you have to apply to the corporate design. Um, so many of the packages that are available to produce graphs uh, directly from uh, R, like ggplot, were not really feasible for us uh, because the, we needed so much code and so much definition to get everything right, the colors, the thickness of lines, um, and so on. So we devised our own tool that's called SVG Tools, and it works that way. Our designers produce templates in Adobe Illustrator, like the one on the right side, that are uninformative. All the values here are um, just somewhere um, on the scale and not where they actually should be in the end. Uh, they don't know about the correct values and don't need to know about them. They just put uh, all the graphical elements there and they name them. Uh, SVG is just an XML uh, format. So when you um, convert it from Adobe Illustrator to SVG, all the elements that had names in Adobe Illustrator now have an ID tag in the XML representation. Like you see on the left side, there's one rect angel uh, that is called Rahmen or frame. Uh, and there is one group of circles that would have the ID K1 M8. SVG, SVG tools uh, then um, sets the graphical elements right, it rescales re and repositions them by using uh, these designations that were given for them. You see uh, in red the frame where we need to position the elements is called Ramen and uh, the group is K1 M8 uh, and we pass on the calculated values. This is what we social scientists uh, again estimated uh, and so in the end we produce uh, the graph that you see uh, on the right with the correct values here for differences um, in mean um, achievement uh, for sex and split by degree of urbanization and status of immigration. The overall uh, perspective to this way that we did it in nine months is that given our limited resources and development time, I think we have used a fine combination of tools and procedures in R to generate a predefined set of education indicators. Yeah, you see what we can't do right now is something like Statistics Austria has with StatCube that uh, the user can calculate uh, whatever he or she may be interested in themselves. The reproduction of all current about 1,000 indicators uh, takes about two hours on a standard PC, um, not counting manual validation steps, uh, of course. So uh, when we want to get rid of a spelling error or that hadn't happened luckily, but um, some miscalculation, for example, 
uh, it's not a huge effort to produce all the material once again. And from my experience generating a new set of indicators uh, from the definition, calculation, designing the, the graphs and so on, uh, takes about a week for one scientist. So this is also very satisfactory. Uh, and when next year the new uh, National Education Report will be published, we will have much more indicators uh, also in the database. The biggest limitation right now is to predefine what we want and also expect what the public and administrative demands uh, for knowledge would be. Because that we have to do ourselves. Nobody uh, can get access that way to the microdata we have as other facilities for uh, these needs. And we still need social scientists with at least better skills in R that are not fearing uh, programming structures like uh, if-else and loops, and uh, who can also manage database access um, to use everything uh, very conveniently. So I thank you for uh, listening to my talk, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Conrad, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we have for you a question coming from uh, Olaf. Um, he appreciated a lot your uh, presentation also. Thanks. And um, uh, he said a uh, very interesting view on social sciences uh, versus programmers. Uh, do you see in future a more narrow gap between them or will this stay and do we have to accept it? No, um, in our institution, the um, procedures for creating software and interacting uh, with the scientists uh, are currently revised uh, and it's um, turning to agile uh, software engineering with tools like Scrum, where uh, the software engineers and the scientists collaborate uh, much, uh, much more intense. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, coming from uh, uh, Alex Kovari. Um, is the way graphical designer defines a CAVG and expert fill it with values a wider strategy for visualization in your institute? I'm sorry, I didn't uh, get it. I'm, I'm reading it right now. Okay, maybe it's better. Yeah, yes, sorry. <laughs> no, I get it. Uh, yes, it, it definitely is. Uh, we um, took uh, SVG tools on CRAN just one week ago. So uh, this is version 1.0, um, but we want to elaborate on that. Uh, the next issue will be that, of course, the um, designer doesn't have to um, put all the graphical elements uh, in the design beforehand, but uh, that the software intelligently uh, duplicates elements um, and has a better understanding of, of, of where they should put uh, in the, be put in the graph. Okay, thank you. If there are not any more questions, um, our session will be closed. Please, uh, Alexander, if you have something to say uh, before uh, the lunch break, uh, you have the floor now. Just thank you to, to all the presenters um, of this session and thank you to Matthias for the uh, morning keynote. Um, we will start again at 2 um, with the next session. So, uh, at least half an hour before there will be the, the WebEx uh, open. Um, if you want to follow up via YouTube, uh, Facebook stream, then the links will be posted on our homepage also during the lunch break. So have a nice lunch if it's actually it's at the time for lunch where you're located. Um, see you later. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, Alex.